Safety at last. Harold Lloyd's latest high and dizzy type of picture is one of the best thrill comedies ever made, and this article explains how he gave the illusion of doing all the stunts of a human fly while making it. By Edwin Schallert. Picture Play Magazine. July 1923. Hurry, hurry, shrieked the stenographer. This boy is going to break his neck as sure as you live, and I do believe it's Harold Lloyd. And with that, she shot up the office window and leaned out, while we excitedly rushed to her side. I was calling on a man whose office was on the top floor of one of the downtown buildings in Los Angeles, the one shown directly below, on the extreme left of the accompanying diagram. In front of us yawned the mighty chasm of the street. Out of it came the roar and clangor as of many rushing waters. The mad turmoil of midday was on. Cars clanged across intersections, automobiles fought their way towards street corners, people dashed in haste, or else moved slowly along in turgid shopping groups. The eye took in the whole picture at a glance, for we were all of twelve stories above the street. But we did not heed the familiar sights. Our gaze followed the upward direction of the girl's pointing finger, and rested on the top of the office building directly opposite. There, she exclaimed, right above the roof, as we strained our necks upward. Sure enough, there he was, a young man with horn-rimmed spectacles, perilously balancing, dizzily swaying at a seemingly terrible height on a sort of parapet or ledge. Harold Lloyd, there could be no mistake. He was on top of a roughly built wall-like structure, which had apparently been left incomplete, for the scaffolding was still showing. It was close to the outer edge of the building, and rose for all of two stories above the roof, and if the comedian had slipped and fallen, it certainly looked as if he might be in danger of tumbling nearly 14 stories to the street. We noted, however, that he had some protection, afforded by a sort of narrow platform that jetted out a few feet in our direction, but, except for a rather shaky extension of the parapet on one side, this had neither fence nor rail to which he might cling in case he lost balance or stumbled and fell from the parapet. High and dizzy again, the office girl exclaimed. Gee, what a nerve. It was thrilling enough to be sure, but after the first rush of excitement was over, it all began to look very strange and puzzling instead. I couldn't quite make out what it was all about. What struck me as remarkable was not the apparent daring of Lloyd. That, I realized, was considerable of its kind, though he was not really doing anything extremely hazardous for one accustomed to taking moderate risks. More puzzling to me, after a moment, was the fact that the back of the set was apparently toward us. I couldn't for the life of me make out what the comedian was trying to do. I couldn't see how we expected to be photographed to any advantage, for to all intents and purposes, the false structure on which he was standing faced in a direction different from that of the building on which it was located, and I couldn't therefore understand why it should not have just as well been built on the ground. I could glimpse the camera high up on a platform to one side, on top of the same building, but that didn't help to solve the question in my mind because it didn't seem that from that angle they could catch more than a corner of the contraption on which Lloyd was working. As I scratched my head reflectively, the comedian paused in his maneuvering, put his hand to his chin meditatively, and then, turning away from us, crouched down and signaled to somebody on the roof of the building. He seemed to be in a bit of a quandary himself, and I didn't wonder at that, although I doubted if his perplexity could equal mine. However, at that moment, my conjecturing was interrupted by the chap whose office I had been visiting and who had remained more or less silent until this time. I don't get this, he said. Let's get a better view. I know a fellow in the weather office over in the building on the next corner. We'll go over there and get out on the roof, and maybe we can see something. As we emerged from the elevator and started walking down the street, I mentally reviewed what had happened, and made up my mind that this was some sort of trick picture. I concluded too that it was a very thrilly sort of trick picture at that. I then recollected that I had heard that Lloyd was working on a feature called Safety Last, and having observed the seemingly dangerous nature of his antics as well as his choice of the roof of a 12-story building for a location, I took it for granted that this was it. On arriving at the top of the building, which was to be our new point of observation, we found our position a more advantageous one in nearly every respect. Although we were now at some distance from the actual set, in fact about half a block away, we could see the front of it distinctly, for it was now facing toward us. We looked over the rear of the building on which it was situated, instead of toward the façade, and could therefore behold all that was previously hidden from sight. What we saw was what you see by looking at the larger diagram on page 22, 
the smaller one being a view from directly above. We made out that the set was designed as part of an office building, showing the two topmost stories. We could even dimly descry the window frames and the shades. At the top, there was a sort of ledge running around, on which, as we observed, Lloyd was now going through some new antics, principally, as far as we could tell, endeavoring wildly to dodge a rotating weather vane. We also noted, and with growing interest, the position of the camera. Here we saw some light at last in our bewilderment. We observed carefully that this camera was about on a level with the set, on a sort of raised platform, and we determined from its position that not only was it photographing the replica of the office building that had been constructed for the picture, but that it was also catching on the celluloid the buildings on the opposite side of the street, and a little of the street itself. Someone then suggested that there was absolutely no doubt but that by some means or other the top stories of the trick building were made to merge on the film with the buildings opposite, and that this was apparently not done by any double exposure. But of that, more later. I don't know whether or not you are familiar with the usual run of thrill pictures of the up-in-the-air type or not, and how they are made. Maybe you are, but at least it won't do any harm to recite some of the rudimentary facts over again, because they will prove enlightening in connection with the innovations in Safety Last. You probably remember High and Dizzy, the picture in which Lloyd once appeared, and which was a high-tension thriller of its kind. And mayhap you have seen Douglas McLean in Bellboy 13, a Thomas H. Ince picture, which is of the same general species. If you understand something of the technique in these, it will be easier for you to comprehend the nature of a newer kind of thrill picture, for the methods used in these others, while essentially primitive, are remotely the same. There are in Los Angeles, close to the business district, several hills that rise abruptly from the street, and they are nearly all used on occasion for scenes in which the illusion of height is desired. From any one of these hills, you can shoot down on the city with a camera and get a bird's eye view of the business district. If you are careful in selecting your position, you can obtain a view right straight down a street, and have a long line of large buildings showing on either side of the photograph. One of these hillside locations is particularly popular with movie folk making thrill pictures, in which high hotels or office buildings are shown. The hill itself interrupts a main thoroughfare that leads to Hollywood. The street goes right under, or through, the hill by means of a tunnel. It is an easy matter to build a set on a little plateau that lies immediately above this tunnel, and by photographing only a small part of this set from the hill and toward the level street, obtain the effect of a considerable height. That is, the player who takes part in the scene can seem to be gallivanting around on the window ledge on the fifth or sixth story of a building, whereas he is only a comparatively few feet above the ground. You can sight the car tracks that lead up to the tunnel, and they look as if they were running right in front of the fake building, whereas they are dodging into the subway beneath, and in the distance you can behold the skyscrapers which immediately call to mind the downtown business section of a large city. This location is high enough and dizzy enough for most purposes, and more than one picture made on it has held audiences tense and spellbound at the seeming dangers of the players who looked as though they were in imminent danger of breaking their necks. In Safety Last, however, the problem for the picture maker was a much naughtier one. It couldn't be solved by the traditionally simple expedient of constructing a pseudo-office building on a hill. The story required that Lloyd should portray a would-be steeplejack, and anything but a gouty steeplejack at that, and climb from the ground clear to about the 12th or 14th story of a large skyscraper. You had, moreover, to see him in various stages of his ascent, at practically every floor, until he appears to be at a wild and baffling height, and in a shivery and hazardous position beside, clutching the edge of a cornice, hanging onto the end of a flagpole, and otherwise apparently risking his neck to the utmost. Of course, not all the stunts that show on the screen were actually performed by Lloyd himself. He admits quite freely and willingly, I believe, that he wouldn't have been such a perfect nut as to do all of them. There are one or two risks that were taken by doubles, I am sure, and the first four or five stories of the climb, that is a good deal of the straightaway from the ground, was probably done by a professional human fly, because there was no trick photography such as double exposure about this picture. However, Lloyd himself was away up in the air most of the time. Once, as a matter of fact, he actually endangered his neck, I am told, and several times if he had lost his balance while cavorting on the edge of the ledge where we watched him, he would have saved himself from a sprained back and possibly several broken bones due to a fall of about two stories, only by a quick jump to a nearby platform, and once, but never mind. The real building which Lloyd selected as the one that he would appear to climb on the screen was well situated for his eventual purposes. It was within a block or so of a turn in the street, 
and consequently, as photographed for the screen, seemed in a slightly different position from the buildings in the background, that is, as regards the street. Much hinged on this original choice, for if need be, the subsequent sets that were built on the tops of various buildings did not have to appear in perfect alignment with the buildings across the way. If you will observe closely the still photograph which shows Lloyd swaying on the ledge, or the one wherein he hangs by the rope, you will note a slight discrepancy in the position of the set and the buildings across the street. That is, the set does not appear to run quite parallel with them. It is remarkable, of course, that this is so difficult to detect, when you consider that the set and the buildings to which it appears to run nearly parallel are separated by the full width of the street. I might explain it, though, by saying that the camera by nature reproduces everything as a flat surface. Lighting, or to be more exact, chiaroscuro, also enters into the phenomenon. By this, I mean that the dark color of the movie set causes it to fall back a trifle in the general perspective, as compared with the slightly lighter buildings, while the sameness of the color or lighting at the points of their apparent contact make the two widely separated camera objects seem to merge. It is an optical illusion, of course, and a very marvelous one. You yourself would never question its seeming reality on the screen, which is natural. You supply the necessary receptiveness to the effect in advance, because you are so thrilled or intrigued most of the time that you have little inclination to question anything or to watch anything but the acting of Lloyd himself under his presumably perilous circumstances. The sets that Lloyd built for his picture, showing him at the different stages of his climb, were all about two or three stories high. The first one that he climbed, a reproduction of the base of the real building used, was built right on the ground at the studio, and he steeplejacked his way up it as far as was reasonably safe while a crowd of shouting extras looked on. Then, one fine morning, he went downtown with his technical staff, and I suspect a professional human fly in tow, wearing a deceptive pair of brown horn rims, in addition to a corps of policemen to hold back the crowd, and the human fly did the necessary five or six stories that you were permitted to look at from the ground. Then came the sequence where Lloyd was shown at a height of about four or five stories, playing around a great big clock. For this, an entirely different location was used, the top of a three-story building, I believe. Extra stories were built in the fashion that I have already described, that is, overlooking the roof, so that they could be made to appear to line up on the film with the structures across the street. Later on, at another location, two or three stories higher, more monkey business was indulged in. I forget just what. Lloyd tries to climb in a window and somebody sticks a bulldog on him, I believe. Anyway, if you are a very close observer of the screen and will notice some of the backgrounds for these later sequences, you may see that the skyline is not the same as in the earlier, nor are the adjacent buildings. But you'll have to have a quick eye to catch this. And the probabilities are that unless you have, you'll miss this point altogether, unless you sit through the picture a second time just for this purpose. Safety last. Well, maybe you'd call it that. But Lloyd would likely refer to it as safety at last and he is just now declaring that he absolutely and positively is not going to make another thriller like this.